right, church, are you ready? Because I do believe that God wants to do something. And when I was praying this morning, um, I really feel that God wants to seal something in our hearts and, and in your hearts this morning as a church. Uh, last week, for those of you that um, weren't here, I was going to give a like literally a five-minute praise of that, so we, we're up to speed in terms of with what I feel the Lord is trying to encourage us as a church in the season that God is speaking. <clears throat> but you know, the book of James says this. It says that a man, it says the word of God is like a man that looks at himself in the mirror. And when he turns away, he forgets what he saw because the word is the perfect law of the Lord and it is a perfect mirror for our lives. In other words, what it's saying is, is if you want to know where your heart is at, if you want to know where your life is at, there's one place to find it and it's in the word of God. But he says a man that's foolish looks at the perfect law, looks at the word of God, looks at what God's word says. The Holy Spirit convicts him, the Holy Spirit speaks to his heart and then turns away and forgets what he looks like. I mean, like, think of the imagery and the picture that God's creating. It's like if I look at myself in the mirror and I'm like, I wonder what I look like. And do I look like Michael? No, you look like John. In other words, what it's saying is when you look in the mirror and you turn away, you think God speaks and says, John, you have not got a generous heart. I'm wanting to instill in you my heart and it's a heart of generosity. But then I look away and I kind of carry on with life and I forget what God's word challenged me in. That's what that word's speaking about in the book of James. And how often we find ourselves at that place. And so what I'm praying and trusting God is that as you and I are exposed to the, to the perfect word of God, that it would reflect to us our hearts you know, that's the incredible thing why God comes in and he deals with us individually and he speaks and he says, John, you, I want to deal with this in your life. I want to speak to this area of your life. Then what I do with that is my response. How do I respond? And he said, a foolish man forgets that. And he just carries on blundering through life as he did before. But a wise man looks at the word and says, God, you've spoken to my heart. You've challenged my heart. You've said something to me. Now, how do I respond? Well, I remember what the word told me about myself. And in doing that, I respond by either yielding to what it says or resisting what it says. And my encouragement to you this morning, church, is, is that we would be the church which looks at the word, looks at God's instruction to us individually and corporately, and then say, God, what do I do with that? Do I ignore it? Do I forget about it? Or when it challenges me, because I know 100%, the Bible said on the day of Pentecost, it said, Peter spoke and he said, men were cut to the heart. You see, when God's word goes out, it cuts to our hearts. It speaks, there's a conviction, there's an underlying thing where God says, right, John, something needs to change in you because my word's not gonna change. Either you change or you don't change and the response is entirely up to you. So, to catch you up quickly, I was dealing with, Ro with Acts 2 verses from verse 42 to the end. I'm gonna read it, I'm gonna give the headlines and I'm gonna go into this morning. It says this in Acts 2 verses 42. Every believer from the Passion Translation was faithfully devoted to following the teachings of the apostles. Their hearts were mutually, mutually linked to one another, sharing communion and coming together regularly for prayer. A deep sense of holy awe swept over everyone. And the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. All the believers were in fellowship as one body, and they shared with one another whatever they had. Out of generosity, they even sold the assets to distribute the proceeds to those who were in need among them. Daily they met together in the temple courts and in, and in one another's homes to celebrate communion. They shared meals together with joyful hearts and tender humility, and they were continually filled with praise to God, enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord kept adding to the church daily those who were being saved. In a nutshell, I said this, I said, and I'm going to, Adam Clark, I found this thing by Adam Clark, a theologian. He says, the Holy Spirit had done in their souls by this refining influence what others vainly expect 
from broad bodily austerities. In other words, we've taken this scripture and we've said, well, if we can make it a formula, so they were devoted to the apostles' teaching, they broke bread, they gathered together for prayer, and they were committed to one another, etc., etc. We make that a formula, now God add to our numbers daily. And what I'm saying is, is those were not the things that was the formula, those were the things that were the result of something that had happened inside of them. And then what I'm saying is, and, and pointing to the scripture is we're looking for a formula so God will add to our numbers. But the reality was, is God had some, done something in their hearts, and because God had done something in their hearts, that was the consequence and the result. So if we want things to change, church, it's never about taking a formula and say, okay, God, we committed to the apostles' doctrine, we meet together to pray, we, and then we've ticked our boxes, so now do something. God's saying, but your heart. Because the issues of life flow from the heart. When I've done something in your heart and allowed something in your heart to change, when that happens, you will then begin to give to the poor, give to those in need. I mean, I don't know about you, but selling something like selling lands, in other words, big money. Um, Ananias and Sapphira said that they sold everything that they had and they brought it to the apostles. One would go, well done, you guys did an awesome job, pretty good. God struck them dead because they were, they, they were dishonest and they lied to the Holy Spirit. I'm just going to leave that there. Why? You see, the thing is, is the, the, the gathering together of the brethren, the coming to church, being with one another, breaking bread, meeting in homes, prayer, that came out of something that had happened by the Holy Spirit in their hearts. And church, until we get to the place of saying, Holy Spirit, stir my heart in these areas because I can give, but I'm giving out of a sense of compulsion. Or I give because I've been stirred by the things of God and the things of the kingdom. And because you've stirred me, my only response is, is that I give. My only response is I share my life with one another. My only response is that I go out there into the world preaching the gospel. Why? Because he's done something in me and I can't keep quiet. You see, that's the difference. And what happens is, is, is we get stuck into these little religious ways of thinking, saying, if I repeat the formula, maybe I'll get a different result. And we repeat the formula and repeat the formula, never forgetting that the formula is the result of what God's done in me. I start to do these things. Why? Because he's changed me and I can't do anything else. So last week I said that the number one, this thing, there were four things from the scripture that they valued and that God had done in their hearts and they allowed this to prevail in the church by the Holy Spirit and then the other things began to flow. Number one, they valued unity. If you want blessing, value unity. The Bible says as God's blessing is where? When brethren dwell together in unity. They valued unity. In other words, I might not agree with everything Jolin says. I might not think that he's the bee's knees, but guess what? Because we are one in Christ. The Bible says is that some of you when, you, when you break bread, he says you haven't discerned the body. Instead, of some of you have become sick and have even died. Why? Because you didn't discern the body. In other words, you held things against somebody else. We're not in unity. That's how powerful the Holy Spirit worked in those days because I didn't discern that he was a believer. I didn't discern that the fact that I'm in Christ makes him a brother in Christ because he's a brother in Christ. I'm not asked, I'm bound to be in unity with that man. Doesn't mean I agree everything he No, absolutely not. Doesn't mean that everything he tells me to do, I do absolutely not. But because you're in Christ and I'm in Christ and I honor God's word, in this church, we are bound in unity. The Bible says God commands his blessing there. We are committed in unity. That means when somebody, that, that means when the leader stands up here, let's not forget who, when God appoints a leader, God's appointed that person to lead this church. Charlene stands up here and says, guys, I feel God saying this week that we're going to be doing what? We're going to be fasting. Oh, well, I don't want to fast. No, we're in unity. We're in unity. And because we're in unity, and because I'm committed to you, and because I honor you, and the second one was a principle of honor. When there is an honoring, you are the leader. You are the one God has appointed to lead this thing. I honor you for who you are. When I honor you for who you are, I have an opinion and I have a way, but guess what? We're in unity and I honor for you, you for who you are. So guess what happens this week? We fast. And my flesh doesn't like it and I don't like it, but guess what? We're in unity. You see, the early church was in unity and the early church, the Bible said this, it said they honored, there was honor and all prevailed. 
Jesus said of Jesus, he said, Jesus couldn't do many, many, many works because they were familiar with Jesus. Isn't this the carpenter's son? Who is this? And he could do no great works except laying hands on a few people. Why? Because there was familiarity. So familiarity breeds contempt. When we no longer value the person sitting next to us. In a husband and wife relationship, when I no longer value my wife and I'm familiar with her, how why is it husbands? Uh, I'm speaking uh, husbands and wives, but husbands because I'm a husband. So why is it that we, the person that we that we love the most, is the person we can be the the, the most glib with with our mouths? Because we know they they there, they're our wives, they're with us. We can be the sharpest with our mouths with them. Am I the only one? But we love them. I value them. She's the one. I mean, I mean. 25 years this year, we've been married, and I'm like, God, but I'm like, I'll say things and I know I don't mean it. Whoa, John, are you getting familiar? After 25 years, value your wife, honor your wife. She's been a gift to you, my boy. Wake up. Okay, God. Oh, you're in unity. The body. The body. The power. And the Bible says, and then the result was, and God added to their number daily those who were being saved because God had done something in their hearts. Point number three. Their hearts were grateful and full of joy. It says this. They shared meals together, but why did they share meals together? Oh, so we, we, once again, the formula, share meals together. Well, let's all get together and have a... Bring in, now, now hear what I'm saying, I'm, don't, don't hear what I'm not saying, bring in, share and get together and have meals, that's great, but what does it come out of? I get together and I share a meal with you, I break bread with you, I have communion with you, I have fellowship, why? why? Because they were, their hearts were joyful hearts filled with tender humility. You see their hearts were filled with joy and they, they were grateful and full of joy. So this was a people that had previously fully embraced the requirements of the law. These were the Jews. This is speaking primarily now. The Gentiles hadn't been added to the church. We're talking about previously these people were fully committed to the law and to the requirements of the law. But now these fully people have, are we now fully embracing what? Grace. How much more grateful can you be? Their hearts, they, they were subject to the requirements of the law. And all of a sudden, somebody comes to you and preaches the gospel of Jesus Christ and says the way you've been living your life with the requirements and the legalities and the, and the, and the, and the weight of never meeting it, never quite meeting the standard. You see, the Jewish people always wanted to have a relationship with God, always wanted to know God, but they always knew they were always falling short, no matter how. And the Bible says, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees, you're never gonna see God. They're like, God, just the weight of I wanna know you, the weight of relationship, they just knew this. And all of a sudden, the freedom that gets, how joyful are you? How grateful are you? How grateful are you for what God has done in your life? You begin to say, God, this is good news. Guess what, church? We have the same thing. All of us, we were not Jews. Any Jews here? No Jews. We're all Gentiles. So every single one of us live Gentile lives. I can put my hand up and attest to what a Gentile life looks like. Back when I was 18, 19, or 19, 20, fresh out of the army, a Gentile life was only made up of two things. Nightclubs and girls. I lived for that. Guys, we know what that's about. The girls, they were probably way more chaste and innocent than we were. But I lived a Gentile life, estranged, separated from God, not knowing what it was to be found in His presence. Separated. But guess what? The weight of that separation was taken off. I was blind, but now I see. I was separated from his presence, but he's made me alive in Christ. And now it is no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me. These Gentiles, these, these Jews had been bound by the law, weighed down by the law. All of a sudden, the gospel gets preached. I live by grace. I live by, by what? Grace. 
that accepts me for who I am in my broken, damaged, Gentile life. Church, that's something to be grateful for. You see, when we stop losing the wonder and awe of our salvation, we stop losing who it is we're serving. You were dead, man. I was dead. I was broken, dead to my sin, separated from God. And this church got it. The early church got it, and I hope we get it. Man, God, I am so excited. And God, every day that I wake up, you would continue to breathe a sense of excitement. I'm not talking about like this giddy little, you know, kitty thing. I'm talking about a deep centered sense in my heart of I live by grace and faith in the one who saved my soul. And that's not just 15, 20 years ago, whatever it was that I got saved. That's today. By the grace of the blood of Jesus Christ that was poured out on that cross, I still today get to meet with him face to face. The basis for worship is gratitude. If I can't be grateful, I'm not going to worship the one who set me free. You see, if I start to hold lightly to my salvation, you see, the Bible says this. It says that we overcome the, the, the world and we overcome the enemy by the blood of the lamb and the power of our testimony your salvation your story church you you want to you want to overcome in your life heaviness the bible says you put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness you want to overcome that you know you weigh down start to get joyful again and grateful again about the fact that you're saved Start to get excited again. You see, this church was excited about, I was bound by the law, the requirements of the law. But there is a new dispensation, the new covenant. And these people were grateful because they were grateful and joyful and excited. They just said, man, let's just get together and let's celebrate this together. It was something that came out of their hearts. You see, the heart, the Bible, it, it says the heart is the organ that the body, in the body, which is the center of the circulation of the blood, and hence was regarded as the seat of the physical life. Your physical life flows from your heart. Your heart stops. You see, you can be brain dead, but you can still function. Your heart stops, everything stops. The flow of life stops. So what circulates in your life and what circulates in this church? Is it a sense that we come here? Kirsty, Kirsty was alluding it, um, to it this morning, saying that there can be lots that we can do, but at the end of the day, are we doing it because we love Jesus? Do we, are we grateful for what Jesus did? I know, I know very often, listen to me. Hey, oh, you're, what, you're talking to the choir here. You know, when, when, when I sign up on, to prepare for a sermon, I know what that means. You don't know what that means, but I know what that means. A sermon, for me, can take anything, shortest time period, eight hours. I'm in for eight. So, so in terms of eight hours studying, I've got to study the word, minimum eight hours, up to, up to I would probably say, 14 to 16 hours. That's what it takes me to prepare a sermon. One sermon Here's the thing. Do you think there's times when I go to prepare a sermon that I'm like, <laughs> I, know what's in here, I know what's in front of me. Between eight and 14 hours of going through notes, research, trying to find the original Greek text, trying to figure out what was being said in the scripture, going to read the, the historical and the biblical background. I've got it. There's times when I'm like, God, can't I just be like a layman? Just Can't I just be like part of the church? There? Can't I just sit and lift my hands and worship? And God says, no. Why are you doing it, John? Why are you doing what you're doing? Are you still grateful for the fact that I set you free? And Because I set you free? You see, that was the thing that motivated Paul. Paul goes out there and he's just like, you can't keep me quiet. You can't shut me up. Why, why, did, why did Paul need to address that then? He says, he says you know, you're, you're like, a, you're like a, um, a, um, a city on a hill. 
Sit in a hill, a, a, a light, it does, you don't hide it under a bushel. You put it on, it becomes, why did he have to say that? Because obviously some people have got to the place where they'd stop being grateful for what God had done in their lives. So they were just like, oh, well, whatever, I'll go to church, I'll do this, I'll do that. And he says, man, no. He says, guess what? I was the Pharisee of Pharisees. I was the worst of the worst. I was killing people. Killing people, persecuting people until Jesus knocked me off my little throne, my little horse. And guess what? I cannot help but being grateful for what he did for me. And I'm so grateful for that I was this. But guess what? I was lost, but now I'm found. And I am grateful. Church, are you getting this this morning? God, help me be grateful. Help me be filled with joy. Every time he'd meet me, he'd say, and may the joy and the grace and the peace of Jesus Christ be with you. Why? Because if you've got no joy, you've got no, nothing to be grateful for. Be excited about your salvation. Be excited about what God's done in you. Revelations 2 verses 2 says this. Speaking to the church at Laodicea, it says, I know your works and your labor and your patience and how you cannot bear with those who are evil and have tried those pretending to be apostles and are not and have found them liars. So he's saying you're doing stuff, you're doing awesome things, great job. And you've born and have paid patience and for my name's sake you've labored and have not fainted. You've done all these good things. Awesome guys, well done, but I have something against you. You've left your first love. You've left your first love. What was the first love? It's the day I said, Jesus, I ask you into my heart. Jesus, stir my heart again. Stir my heart again. Stir my heart again with a love for you, a love for your people, and a love for your bride. Because guess what? John 17, Jesus prayed for the bride. Father, that they would be one as you and I are one. You see, Jesus loved the bride. You see, you can't, I've heard many, I've seen many uh, tweets and scriptures. You cannot, and I believe this one, we cannot tell tell ourselves we love Jesus and yet despise the bride. Because Jesus died for the bride and that means everybody within the bride. You see, sometimes we're a little bit like, it's a little bit like the, the Goldilocks syndrome. A little bit hot, a little bit cold. Oh, you're just right, you're just my people. You're just perfect. You're just right. It's the bride. It's the bride of Christ. You see that person sitting next to you? Husbands, don't look at your wives. The person, the other person sitting next to you, that is the bride of Christ. And Jesus died for that person as well as you. He said, but I have this against you that you've left your first love. He says, therefore this, he says, it says these things. He says, therefore, remember where you've fallen. Remember, repent, and then do your first works. Or else I will come quickly and remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. See, basically what he was saying this, he said, there's a lampstand, he says, but there's no flame. There's a lampstand. And this is, I believe, why church has just become buildings. Clearly not talking about this. Us, churches. Because we have a lampstand with no flame. You see, the lampstand provided light. Church, is this light? Do we value? You see, because when when, when somebody, when somebody, I was going to tell a funny story, but then I won't. No, not that story. This is a story that I had in my head, but I won't. You know, quickly, I'm not going to tell the story. God God sometimes uses me to have words for people, words of knowledge for people. And there's times when I have those words that you do realize that they're not always in church. It happened this week twice, once while I was walking outside the Tate Museum and the other time while I was on a subway. Here's the problem. If I'm concerned and I'm not grateful for what Jesus did for me in my brokenness, I'm never going to step outside myself. This church, the early church, was, was grateful and full of joy. And I look at those two people. The one guy, funny enough, he was a tarot card reader. He was a 
fortune teller. He had all his tarot cards and he looked a little bit like dark and dangerous, but that was fine. And the other guy was that, the other one didn't go so well, an older gentleman with a beanie on his head. The point being is in both those, the, both those instances, I felt God saying, I want you to say this, this, and this for their life. In both those instances, if you think I kind of just, I've got to grapple with my own flesh. I've got to grapple with my own flesh, especially in the UK, because in the UK, you, you, you mean, A, there's lots of people around, and B, people like you are just weird, as I experienced with the second guy. <laughs> this story for a later date. But here's the thing. In both those occasions, in my heart, I had this conversation. Jesus, if you do it for me, why can't I do it for him? If you did it for me, if I, and I actually, the guy in the, in, the, in the train, I was sitting and I thought to myself, God, if I was sitting there, because I, I felt that this, there's certain things going on in his life. If I was sitting going through what he's going through, how would I respond if somebody walked up to me in my hurt and brokenness and said this to me? In other words, God's in your mess and he's going to help you if you will let him. But if I shut up because of my own insight, but I value, I value you, I value what you did and I value this man more than I value my insecurities and my weaknesses and my fear and my humanity because you paid a price. Jesus, you paid a price. Help me. And I'm telling you, the second one was a pretty, oh, it went very pear-shaped. But here's the thing. I will become even more undignified than this. And Jesus, if I look like a fool, I'll look like a fool. Once again, I'm not talking about going now to Hyde Park, standing in the middle and on a soapbox and just shouting at people. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a church that is so impacted and so grateful for what Jesus did for them that when it comes to praise, they won't shut up. When it comes to speaking out and doing what God's called for you, you're not going to stop me. And I will wake up, and even though I don't feel a million bucks, I'm still going to be grateful for what Jesus did on the cross for me. And I still tomorrow will be grateful for what Jesus did on the cross for me. Because what he did for me, he did for you. And what he did for you, he wants to do for somebody else. And that early church was filled with that, that type of gratitude and that type of awe. I love this. Jeez. The remember, repent, and do. I love this. Check this. When I went and, so for me, when I went and originally, when I researched the word do, because I'm like, God, you, you, you know, do. In other words, like tr the, one would think, try harder. So remember where you came from. Remember the fact that you've, you, you've lost your first love, John. Remember, repent, heart, and then do. Ooh. But check what, check what the word do means. The word do means this, to be the author or the authors of a cause. In other words, to start to write something that changes the story or the narrative. In other words, do something that changes where you're at now. You have the pen. When he says, now go and do, remember what Jesus did. Repent that your heart's become cold and not grateful. Now do, take the pen, start to write a different story. Start to write a different story. I know for Kirsten and I, when we've got to those places where we're no longer grateful, I physically go and I go, point number one, God, I am grateful for my salvation. Point number two, God, I'm grateful for my wife and my kids. Point number three, God, I'm grateful for the fact that I've got a roof over my head. I go back to those simple things. I go and physically write them and I've seen Kirsty physically write them. He said, well, that's simple. Yeah, guess what? It's that simple. I start rewriting the narrative of my life that says I'm miserable and I'm upset and I don't like the circumstance and I don't like the situation. And hey, ho, ho, hey, I've been in situations that I'm like, God, what the heck? The early church, this church was a persecuted church, which leads me to my next thing. Praise of God consumed them. The Bible says this. It says, 
They shared meals together with joyful hearts, glad hearts, tender and, hu and, hum and humble hearts. And they were continually filled with praise to God, enjoying the favor of the people. And God added to their number daily those who were being saved. They were filled with praise. The greatest value places the value in the right place, which is where? Why we do what we do. Why? Why do you do what you do? Why do you worship Jesus? Why do you love him? What do you worship? Who do you worship? I worship him. My value is placed in the right place. The value is placed on Jesus. The value is not placed on my comfort. The value is not placed in my circumstance. The value is not placed on whatever it is that we think the value needs to be. The value is placed on Jesus. And when I place the value on him, I can go. Paul said, my value, my life is found in Jesus. I place my value there. And because I place my value there, I can be shipwrecked. Because I place my value there, I can be beaten. Because I place my value there, I can be a martyr for him. You see, we're not just those kind of people that just says, God, I'll go through it because I can. But even in my trial, even in my circumstance, even in my worry, even in my concern, even in my lack, even in my beatings, Paul could say this, I have learned to be content and my praise will still go up. Where did Paul and Silas release their praises? In the prison. In the prison church. Can you see the heart of these men that prevailed? They would say, this was the persecuted church. This was a church at that point in time, Acts 2.42. Paul was out killing them, rounding them up, killing them. And the Bible says as they continued gladly with praise. This is a persecuted church. You see, the thing is, is if our circumstances and our trials dictated, and that was the barometer or the thermostat to our praise, then this church would have been a very quiet church. But it wasn't. What was the barometer? They placed their value in the highest place, which was where? On Jesus. And they said, the world can be falling. You see, that's why, that's why we can be an overcoming church. We can be one of the things we had in great time. The church I see is a confident, victorious, overcoming church. Well, today I woke up and I don't feel grateful. I don't feel confident and I don't feel victorious and I don't feel overcoming. So what do I do? Take out your pen. Remember, repent, start to write a different story. Today I will praise Jesus. Today I will sing his praises. Today your, your song, your praise will be on my lips. You see church, and I'm gonna start to end here. Remember this is the persecutor. They were the most overcoming joyous people because of who they chose to praise. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I actually wanted to tell you the story. I've got five more minutes. When we were in Great Town, one of the things that we, that we um, had done, one of the many things that we had done while we were there in the 13 years we were there, is we owned and ran a coffee shop. And for about, for about two years, we ran a um, home industries. And then for about four years, we, we ran um, a, a very successful coffee shop that did really well. But it got to a point where through various circumstances, if you, anybody knows Debonair's Pizza, do not buy Debonair's Pizza. They took away 50% of our business. So. But through, uh, through circumstances, we lost our coffee shop. We lost our business. And we were really, I mean, we were in debt, blah, 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 long story short. We had a very close couple, friend of ours, who were in the church. They were elders in the church. But besides being elders with us in leadership, they were really good friends of ours. The day that that happened, so here's two things that they did. We, the, the, day, the, the, the day that we, fi that we actually sh that we found out the news, that like we've made the decision, I just said, because if we carry on on this, we're going to get deeper and deeper and deeper in the hole, and our debt's going to increase. We've actually got to call time on this thing and you know, lift off the paddles, and that's it. She's got to die. My wife was devastated because it was her baby. You know what they did, this couple? They got out of their house. They came around to our home. She played piano. She said, right, you two, stand over there. Gareth and Rini, Kirsty and myself, for about an hour to an hour and a half, we worshiped Jesus. We just lost our coffee shop and we were 70,000 rand in debt. And she said, I don't care what's going on, we're gonna worship Jesus. Why? 
because he's why we do what we do. You see, we were faced with an impossible situation. We were faced with bad news. Why do I do what I do? And where are my eyes going to be fixed on? Jesus. And then about a week later, we had the official, official, official closing, and we went round. And we thought to ourselves, we're going to celebrate. True story, not made up. And we invited our friends around, and we took the last of our stock, and we made cakes, and we made all sorts. And we said, the shop's going down. The ship's sinking, but guess what? I'm going to be playing my tunes. You know, like the Titanic when they band played literally and we celebrated and we worshiped Jesus do you know within a year we didn't know any money on that shop we had we had we had creditors coming to us and saying you don't have to pay us back we had supernatural provision come in and when I say 70,000 rand you must know back back then probably 10 or 12 years ago in South African terms 70,000 rand was could have for us could have been 7 million rand there was no way we could pay that money back. But in the circumstance, in the, why do I do what I do? It was heavy, man. But I chose to worship Jesus. I chose to be grateful despite what I faced. Their lives were never centered around themselves, this early church. Their lives were always centered around. You see, when their lives were never centered around themselves, their lives were centered around Jesus. They could do the fellowship. They could break bread. They were in covenant. They were committed. They were the church. And I'm going to end in the scripture, and I'm going to ask my wife to pray. 2 Chronicles 7.15 says this. Now my eyes, remember in the Old Covenant and the Old Testament, everything that's there speaking about the church to come, about the bride. This is the picture of God's heart towards the church. Now my eyes shall be upon, my eyes shall be upon, my eyes shall be open, and my ears shall be open to the prayers of this place. Talking about the church. For now I have chosen and sanctified this house so that my name may be there forever. And listen to this. And my eyes and my heart shall be there forever. On Jesus' bride, his eyes are on you and his heart is in you. On the bride, my eyes are on you, my heart is in you. Church, his church great time, God's eyes are on you and his heart is in you. Katie, God's eyes are on you and his heart is in you. Mark, God's eyes are on you and his heart is in you. He's never turning away. How will we respond? We're the called out ones. We are the church. When God wants to do something in the world, when God wants to do something here in Kingston, who's he looking to? The church. When God wants to touch a life and some man in a funny beanie on the other side of the road and God says to you, speak to that man, who's God going to use? The church. When God needs you to reach out and touch somebody in the body who's broken and hurting, who's God going to use? The church. Why don't you stand with me? So, you know, sometimes there's a word that goes out and it's, um, it's great and we move on. But I just feel this morning, if we could just take five minutes and really just let the word sink into our heart and to not be in a rush to rush out, but to just really we, we maybe we've, you know, last week God, uh, Donna, God, Don, um, Donna spoke about how when we honor something, it's the fact that it carries a weight. But when we dishonor it, it's kind of almost like a vapor. And I, I think that's such a beautiful picture. And you know, sometimes 
with church and those of us who are in church together and we're doing life together, we can sometimes, there can be just a little level of just that vapor aspect with one another. I just kind of just that, you know, with one another. And, and it's not even that it's um, like we irritated or it's just a heart, just a heart thing. And so we can almost become like that with the church. We can become... Um, you know, we can hold her lightly, if that makes sense. We can, we can hold her lightly. And I understand. I figured out after the years of being in Greytown, and we loved it, and we love God, and I'm grateful for that season. But there was something in my heart towards the church that I, I only, when I look back and hand, when I had the year and, and that year at his church, Pantine, that like God really restored my love for the church. Like I love Sundays and I love the fact that we're all together, but I almost, and Simon just laughed at me. I said, oh, I love the unsaved. You know, I'd love to be with the unsaved. And, but I know that God has called me to the church and, and I just over last year began to just see how just God began to restore my love and the value and the honor that he has for the church. And the church is not just a functional thing, but she's a living, breathing. And every church will have her personality and will have her expression. And so had to after being in the ministry for 19 years and being saved since I was seven I had to go before God and say God help me to value her as you value her that it, she wouldn't in my heart be just this vapor and poof, but that I'd really value her and so I'm just asking in this time that if there's been any of that in your heart. And again, I say it with humility because I, I absolutely found myself in that place. So it's not a place of, of judgment or condemnation, but if we if we found ourselves in the insides of our heart, just being vaporish with her, we would just repent. And just take this moment to just go, God, I'm sorry for not having her properly weighted in my heart. valuing her and seeing her and what makes what makes up the body and what makes the parts and and who makes the parts and and who belongs and who is so just holding that lightly in my heart so just if we can take a few minutes to just search our own hearts we've just your word says that you search our hearts and you know the thoughts and the intents of our heart Father I pray today that if there has been in any area of our lives and in our heart where we've we've just really held your bride just lightly and not really valued and valued one another and valued leadership and valued just the beautiful differences that we have in the body and valued the eye and, and the mouth and the ears and the feet and, and just the beautiful aspects of the body of Christ. Father, that you would, first of all, God, just forgive us for not seeing her as you see her. God, that you would help us to just 
to see her with your eyes. Father, I pray that if there's been scales, or even if there's been, church, if there's been injury, and so there's been like scabs almost that have come. And Father, I thank you today that there'd be such a healing in our hearts. And we would value her. And, and Father, we would honor her. And we'd va- we would value and honor leadership. And we would value and honor one another. And we would see each other as, as you see us. It was such a beautiful picture last week of how the different spices made up that anointing oil. And how it's our differences and the different gifts and the different abilities and the different talents that actually make us this beautiful whole. And so Father, I pray that you would help us to see your bride as you see her. Father, that you would help our hearts to be grateful, that you would help our hearts, God, to just be those of praise and Father, just those that are honoring and those that are, Father, truly just live in a place of just absolute gratitude for everything that you've done for the cross, for loving us, for finding us as we are and loving us. And Father, that we would be a people as we carry your bride with weight and with honor and value. Father, and as we carry one another with weight and honor and value, that Father, your blessing would rest on our lives because your Bible, your word promises us that as we dwell in unity, that your commanded blessing is upon us. And so Father, I pray that you would find a church today who value each other in our hearts and who value this beautiful bride and who live in unity. And because we live in unity, your commanded blessing would be our portion today. And so we thank you for your goodness. And we thank you for your commitment and your continued faithfulness to us. In Jesus' precious name. And everybody said, Amen.